So here are the lipid metabolism and coronary heart disease slides that I never got a chance to get through at the beginning of the term. So coronary heart disease, if you haven't already covered it with another lecturer or in another module, is when you have atherosclerosis um, specifically in the arteries of the heart. So not the arteries, uh, not the aorta or any of these larger vessels that are, are feeding the heart with the blood, but the actual arteries that feed the muscles of the heart, the muscle, the muscle cells. So in this particular diagram here, you see an individual's heart and you see what a normal looking um, coronary artery should look like, clear, and if you did a cross section and look through, it should be very clear, no visible plaque, and the lumen um, is free of any visible uh, obstruction or blockages. But in the narrowing of the artery, of the coronary artery, it would look something like this, which is very similar to any other um, artery or blood vessel that's um, susceptible to atherosclerosis. You end up with a plaque developing in the arterial wall, and this continuously grows, in, and as it does, it reduces the size of the lumen, uh, which reduces the, um, or constricts the blood flow through this portion of the artery. And if you have a thrombotic event where you have debris from a ruptured plaque or an unstable plaque um, uh, letting loose into circulation, it can actually block off uh, the artery farther down where it narrows. Another example or another diagram outlining this is shown here, where you see on the right hand, on the left hand side, you see the coronary artery as it feeds, and the the, the vessel narrows as it gets as it reaches the terminal end of the um, where it's supplying blood. And if you have your blockage about midway up this artery, and you have a thrombotic event that causes a blockage to occur in the between the plaque and the arterial wall, everything downstream of this point no longer receives oxygenated blood, and this this part of the heart begins to die. So this is this is the um, the hallmarks of myocardial infarction. So we spend a lot of time talking about coronary heart disease because it's the largest contributor. Um, alongside cerebrovascular diseases or strokes um, to deaths or incidences of cardiovascular disease events. And this uh, diagram here demonstrates for both A is um, uh, men and B is women, but it demonstrates for you, uh, or sorry, illustrates for you, the um, proportion of cardiovascular events that are related to either ischemic heart disease, which is myocardial infarction or coronary heart disease, cerebrovascular disease, which is stroke, or other types of vascular disease, um, which are classified under the um, heart and cardiovascular disease category. In terms of trends and rates of coronary heart disease events in um, the world, you can see from this diagram, this is a recent uh, review by Ezati and all, um, published in Nature Reviews Cardiology. And you can see here that there's quite a variation in the incidence, um, so or number of CVD deaths per 100,000 people in a population, depending on where you look in the world. So here in the middle is the black line, and it's the world average. So this is not taking anything into account in terms of uh, income, um, healthcare systems, anything like this. This is just for, uh, counting number of deaths per 100,000 people in the population from a cardiovascular event. So this is the world um, trend line from about 2000 to maybe, this looks like it cuts off probably around 2013. And you can see that the overall trend has been a declining trend, so less people are dying per year of a cardiovascular disease event. However, now when you split this out, um, sometimes you get these graphs and they're done by country, sometimes they're done by geographical region, but in this particular case they're separated based on income. So higher income countries in the world, so this would include North America, most of uh, Western Europe. And what you're seeing here is they have the lowest incidence um, um, of cardiovascular death or lower uh, rate of cardiovascular death um, compared to all other regions and even compared to the world average. And then as you look at uh, less developed or developing countries, you can see that the rates are much higher, but overall you should take out of this that there's also a declining trend no matter where in the world you live. So you may live in a country which, or a region which has quite high rates, close to 1,500 per 100,000 people dying of coronary or cardiovascular event. But since 2000, even in those countries, the trend has been a declining trend. This is how the burden of ischemic heart disease or coronary heart disease looks 
uh, on the world, if you look at it from a world perspective, so the top graph is men and the bottom graph is women, and it shows you the distribution and, and it matches very nicely with the um, diagram I showed you in the previous slide, where you can see uh, the Eastern European countries, some of the African countries, and Central Asian countries having the higher incidences or higher um, uh, contribution um, of cardiovascular disease to, um, to, to, or in this particular case, sorry, ischemic heart disease to death. And then if you look at more developed or economically um, uh, larger uh, income countries, you can see that there is uh, less lower rates. So this is a slide that illustrates the progression of cardiovascular disease. <clears throat> so this would occur either in the arteries of the heart, so the coronary arteries, or this could be occurring in other vessels um, at other points in the body. Um, so collectively, this process is um, what underpins cardiovascular disease progression in general. And so if you look here along the top, you can see the process that's occurring, that's leading to the atherosclerosis. And beneath that, there is, um, it's listed as target. And what target means is what specific part of the physiology um, could you look at to um, assess whether or not there's a change occurring uh, that's, that's indicative of development of cardiovascular disease. And so if you look initially at the initial, uh, the very early stages of atherosclerosis, it's, it's, it's an endothelial cell dysfunction. So this, the endothelial cells are the cells uh, that line the artery and that separate the, um, the lumen and the blood component from the um, intima and um, uh, uh, the interstitial, sp the, sorry, not the, interstitial, the, the space between the lumen and the harder tissue, or the more solid tissue. Um, and what you see here <clears throat> is the infiltration of LDL particles. And this, these particles tend to be um, smaller and denser. So the smaller and denser, the more like, the more uh, likely they will find their way through this endothelial barrier and into this into this space. And these then trigger a series of events. Um, so the activation of specific um, um, adhesion molecules, which re re recognize these LDL particles as being foreign. Uh, this leads to an increase in inflammation in this space where macrophagia and T cells are recruited and they begin to dispose of the LDL particles and foam cell development begins. But then this then triggers apoptotic events where cells in this area and as well as the foam cells begin to die and become necrotic. Once this stage occurs, you can see there's a ramping up of the uh, development of the atherosclerotic plaque and you end up with um, lipid core with fibrous cap developing and then this is basically trying to encapsulate this large lipid core which shouldn't be in this space and um, there's been a triggers, there have been several triggers here to um, uh, recruit cells and um, for blood cells to regrow and remodel. What you end up having then occur is platelet aggregation and fibrinogen um, responding as well to try and uh, plug up some of the holes that are now occurring in the lumen or in the um, endothelial cell wall. And when this occurs, you end up with a thrombosis. And so this is a fibrous cap that sits on top of a very unstable lipid plaque. And this, once you've reached this stage right here, you're in a state of having an unstable, um, uh, unstable plaque. Uh, and this generally is what leads to eventually uh, myocardial infarctions or strokes uh, when these caps begin to break off and travel through the bloodstream and get, um, get lodged or occlude blood vessels, smaller blood vessels farther downstream. So where does diet and lifestyle play uh, a role, coronary heart and other vascular disease? Is it more from a prevention perspective? Can we use this for treatment? Well, first thing I'm gonna do is take you back to the Azadi et al. Um, review that I showed you earlier. And they have a very um, interesting table here which outlines cardiovascular risk factors that might underlie cardiovascular mortality trends. And it lists everything based on the risk factor and then what type of risk factor it is so this gives you a better description of um, how, whether or not it's modifiable, behavioral sort of um, perspective. And then it gives the temporal response. So what happens if you stop or you can remove that risk factor or change that risk factor? And so it's a very nice summary table. And it goes down through some of the behavioral, uh, like smoking and alcohol consumption. And then it gets into things like adiposity. How does that contribute? And so it, this is an intermediate trait. 
uh, and it affects other mediators, things such as blood pressure, lipids, inflammation, glycemia, and diabetes. And then so there's, um, then it shows you that there's limited evidence that weight management alone will um, reduce cardiovascular um, um, disease from a treatment perspective. So this is more so contributing to the development, but then removing this particular stressor does not necessarily mean that you can reverse the process. Blood pressure, again, is an intermediate effect and it seems to progress uh, the worse blood pressure management you have, uh, it tends to uh, push you towards having ischemic heart disease and stroke. Um, serum cholesterol, there's clear evidence that if you decrease your serum cholesterol that you can decrease your risk, um, but it takes a substantial amount of time to reverse your um, development, or your plaque development, uh, or to even slow the plaque development. Then it gets into glycemia and diabetes, and then at the bottom here you see nutrition, and again this is showing that there's some evidence from randomized controlled trials that salt and different types of fats and oils can result in mediating your risk factors, uh, but there's very little evidence to show that diet um, uh, changes will actually per, uh, reverse or use, can be useful for treatment. So to back this up with some data, uh, this is a very recently published um, prospective cohort study from uh, Frank Hugh and Walt Willett's groups at Harvard. And what they did in this particular prospective cohort study was to look at when you replace saturated fats with either unsaturated fats or various sources of carbohydrate in the diet, how does this affect your relative risk of developing coronary heart disease? And so a key outcome in this study was that they demonstrated that car uh, saturated fat intakes alone, when you account for all other risk factors that are associated with coronary heart disease, don't independently drive the development or the incidence of coronary heart disease. Um, so that's having a myocardial infarction or some other cardiovascular event. That's not to say that it doesn't contribute, but it's not an independent factor. So you, so those individuals who had the highest consumption of saturated fat had no higher um, incidence. Uh, the group that had the highest uh, intakes of saturated fat did not have a uh, higher incidence of um, coronary heart disease events compared to the lowest intakes, but only after accounting for all other risk factors, so weight, BMI, smoking, hypertension, diabetes status, cardiovascular disease in the family, these sorts of things. Very long list. Um, so if you look at that data on its own, it looks like most saturated fat is not bad and, it's, and it can be considered healthy um, because there's no added risk. However, you can't remove the, the uh, you can't separate the fact that it contributes with other risk factors so that it's, what this, this data shows is not that saturated fats are healthy and they're okay to consume. What it shows is that it, it doesn't independently above all these other risk factors contribute on its own to the development or incidence of coronary heart disease. This is a very clear distinction to make. And this is sometimes where um, these types of studies, the data gets uh, misconstrued in headlines and, and um, popular media press coverage. What they also showed though, through a modeling exercise where they <clears throat> began to look at individuals, began to model what would occur if you restarted replacing saturated fat equivalents, um, so energy, the same, the, the, the energy equivalent that was replaced is here in parentheses next to the type of fat. And so if you do an isocaloric substitution of saturated fatty acids with 2% trans fats, so 2% saturated fats for 2% trans fats, you can see that your risk uh, worsens for the development of coronary heart disease. However, if you replace saturated fats, 5% of energy of saturated fats with 5% from energy of monounsaturated fatty acids, then you see that you get almost a 15 to 16% decrease in your risk of developing coronary heart disease. If you replace 5% saturated fats with 5% PUFA, you get nearly a 30, 25, 27% reduction in your risk of developing coronary heart disease. Replace it with refined sugars, the risk worsens, but if you replace it with, with whole grains at a 5% level, you can see that your risk decreases. So this is demonstrating that the, while the saturated fats don't independently contribute to coronary heart disease uh, outside of uh, the, the other collection of risk factors, reducing your saturated fat intake actually reduces your risk of coronary heart disease. So this has shown that it does this independently of the other risk factors. So if you do decrease your saturated fat intake, you will lessen your risk or improve your, your risk score. Um, 
which is a significant piece of information to take away. So it is demonstrating that saturated fats are not a healthy component. High intakes of saturated fats are not a healthy component when they could be substituted for other uh, equivalent healthy fats um, or whole grains as opposed to refined grains. And then there's some similar data here below where you see if you take the uh, isocaloric substitution of carbohydrates from refined starches and added sugars and you replace them with either saturated fats which have no benefit or monounsaturated fats at 5% or polyunsaturated fats at 5 at 5% you can see you get an improvement in your risk so a risk reduction and then replacing uh, added sugars and refined starches with whole grains same effect up to a 10% 10 or more percent reduction in your relative risk of developing coronary heart disease. So th this, the data that they show here, which are from two very large cohort studies, the um, nurses health study and the health professionals follow-up study. A lot of individuals uh, studied and uh, followed and a lot of dietary data to go through, but they've demonstrated here that there's clear benefit to reducing both of these components in your diet in terms of prevention. So, but this starts at a younger age. So this is not something that you start once you've been identified as um, someone with an advanced atherosclerotic um, uh, development, either coronary or um, whole body, cerebrovascular, whichever. This is at that point, it's a treatment perspective. This is not that's not prevention. This is this is public health information that we should be looking at dietary patterns starting at a young age to prevent and lower your. Risk. So these last few slides are going to outline the. Uh, the effects or the contribution that fruit and vegetable consumption has on coronary heart disease. What's not been shown is that in prevention trials or in intervention trials where you intervene to either um, assess the occurrence of coronary heart disease or to reverse or reduce risk factors, that higher consumption or uh, yeah, in higher consumption or intervening with um, more portions uh, uh, or specific fruits and vegetables does not seem to have any impact whatsoever on the development of coronary heart disease. So this doesn't sound very favorable and it kind of goes against the, the public health policies that we have where we try to push for five a day and, and these kinds of programs. What this review does show is that there are links, positive links between fruit and vegetable consumption and coronary heart disease, but independently they don't prevent. So consuming higher fruits and vegetables but maintaining other risk factors is what this means. So having a substantial load of other cardiovascular risk factors will not negate each other and reduce your risk. Um, and this can be seen in some of the tables. So these are very large cohort studies. So this is table two from the from this review where they're comparing usually the highest and lowest intakes. And, and what you see here is that from all of these large either fruit and vegetable intake uh, as, as the intervention, fruit or vegetable, these large cohort studies are showing that there is no, if you look over here at the trend, the test for the trend, these p-values should be less than 0 0.05, uh, preferably less than 0 0.01 or lower. What you see is that there is no relationship between higher consumption um, of fruits and vegetables and cardiovascular or coronary heart disease events. It gets a little bit more uh, positive for the fruit and vegetable story if you look at just overall cardiovascular or coronary heart related mortality and what you see here there are a couple of studies which show that there is a, a, a positive relationship these are very specific interventions that were carried out um, and then uh, and what you can see from this data is that it's a bit of a mixed um, story so if you look at some of the larger cohort studies like in Haynes um, uh, the health professionals follow-up study, these sorts of things. What you see is there's no effect, but then you have some of these other studies, this JACC study here, where you see that there was a positive effect of fruit and ve or, uh, vegetable consumption. And here you see there was a positive effect of um, fruit and vegetable consumption. So it's a mixed story, but overall you can't define fruit and vegetable intake as being preventative on its own. It has to be taken into consideration with the other risk factors. That's a key message that uh, needs to be understood when you look at fruit and vegetable recommendations and how they relate to coronary heart disease. So that's all the slides I had. I'm going to post two or three uh, other review papers on the topic, which should match in nicely with the slides that Dr. Hall is going to uh, present with you. And hopefully you um, have a good understanding now of how lipoprotein metabolism and lipid metabolism 
feeds into the development of coronary heart disease and the role that diet tends to play in that development.